Good morning, Junction Church, and I'm so glad that you have joined us for our online service. And before I go to the sermon, I'd just like to invite every single one of you to join us for our Victory Weekend. It's going to be Friday evening, the 16th of April, and Saturday morning, the 7th, till just after lunch. And the Victory Weekend course is designed to help you overcome in your Christian walk, to live a victorious Christian life, and also to be set free from some of the things that some Sometimes hold us back in our Christian walk. So come and join us for that. You can sign up by going to our um, website on the event section, or you can sign up using our app, and we hope to see you there this coming weekend. But now, as I continue on this sermon, in the beginning of the year, we went on a journey when we looked at the awesomeness of who God is. And we followed that up with a series where we looked at how we can hear God's voice. It was a call to intimacy with God. But you know what? As believers, we need to realize that we cannot live out our faith only as individuals personally and also not only by hanging out with church people. Our faith was meant to be shared with the world. Christianity is not only an inward experience, it is an outward experience as well. In fact, the very reason why the church exists, one of the fundamental reasons for its existence, is because it exists for people that do not belong to the church yet. That is the call that God has for us. So even though at the beginning of the year we were focusing on how we can grow in God, over the next three weeks we're going to be focusing on how we can live an outward looking life. And we're going to do this series that we have entitled Just One, An Outward Focused Life. If we as a church could commit to reaching just one person, it'll have earth-shattering consequences in our community. Do you know what? Because when you reach that just one person, you won't be able to help yourself to reach another and so to catch the heart of this series, we're going to look at Luke chapter 15 in one of the most famous stories in the Bible where Jesus tells the parable of the lost sheep, the 99 and the 1. And in fact, when we look at the Gospel of Luke in chapter 15, it's the first of three consecutive stories where Jesus speaks about how people can live a missional life. It includes the prodigal son and the parable of the lost coin, but we're going to focus on the parable of the lost sheep and it says the following now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying this man receives sinners and he eats with them so he told them this parable what man of you having a hundred sheep if he has lost one of them does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it and when he has found that he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. In this passage, Jesus is contrasting the Pharisees' disgust at hanging out with sinful people, and he contrasts it to his absolute joy at seeing a sinner come to Christ. Not only that, it contrasts how many pastors, churches, and Christians sometimes are quite content on counting the 99 rather than reaching the lost one in their community. And not only that, Jesus sarcastically also contrasts the Pharisees' no need to repent with his absolute rejoicing when he sees a sinner repenting and how heaven will rejoice when a sinner actually repents. Do you know what? We should be rejoicing when the lost are coming in to the kingdom of God. And so here's the catch. 
the reason why you are sitting here listening to this message is because somewhere along the line, God was running after you. But not only God, there was either a person or a group of people who were hunting you down. You were there, just one. You were there, one lost sheep. And they were praying for you, maybe. Maybe they shared the gospel with you, or they served you, or they invited you to their home or for coffee, or to a church service, or to a marriage course. And here here you are sitting today because there was a believer or a group of believers that were living their Christian faith outwardly. And that is the call that each and every one of us needs to have. Now, this is important and something that we need to take very dear. How do we even do this? Where do we start? Because I know this is really intimidating for many people, but I want to have you relax for a moment. Living an outward living life, an outward focused life, is more about the heart of wanting to influence the lives of people and finding and seeking opportunities where you can pray for them, share with them, and also serve in that community. Remember, we are inviting people into our lives. We're influencing them. So you are going into their world and you are inviting them into your world. That is the call that God has for us. And so what is important for us as we continue here? I think Paul says it so well about how we can seek for these opportunities. And so he speaks to us in Colossians chapter 4, which says the following. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on the account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Notice how Paul is actively praying and looking for opportunities where he can share the gospel clearly and influence people's lives. And so we as well need to be always looking for those opportunities where we can share the hope that we have. But the clincher comes in verse 5. So check this out. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. As believers, we need to realize we've got a very short time to live this outward living life of purpose to go and reach outsiders. Now, what's important is we need to look for opportunities where we can pray, where we can share, where we can serve people in a way and interact with people in a winsome way so that we can also reach them. Now, what's important is that we as Christians do not want outsiders to remain outsiders. In fact, just like Jesus, we want outsiders to become part of the flock. That is the very reason why we are here as God's army to reach people for the kingdom of God. Now the question for many is, where do we start? Now, what we are not asking you to do is to take a megaphone to Danefern Square and go and preach at all the people passing by or to dress up in a suit and go and knock on people's doors and ask a chance for you to share the gospel with them. Now, yes, there are people that have done this successfully and even to this day. However, for the regular average Joe in Junction Church, I'm sure you shudder at that thought. And I want to tell you that for, for most of us here, it's it starts with having relationships with people in our community. We need to connect with people relationally in our community so that we can reach them. Now, one of the greatest stories in the Bible we find in Luke chapter 9. It's the calling of Matthew, or as he was called, Levi as well, and how they interact with people in the community in a winsome way so that the community can be reached for Christ. So I'm going to catch up the story and I hope you enjoy it. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with him. 
And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And so the first thought, the practical thought that I want to leave with us this morning is that Jesus sought connection with the lost. Jesus sought connection with the lost. Now Matthew, or Levi as he's called here, was a tax collector. Now to understand the context here, tax collectors were reviled by the Jewish people, and not only by the Jewish people, but by most folks around. They worked for the Roman government. They were known as traitors, as thieves with their hands in the till. They would intimidate people and, and uh, they, would, they would force people to give them money or they would decide whether someone could do business or not do business. These guys were like the ancient form of the mafia, intimidating people. They were reviled. And so Jesus goes straight up to Matthew while he's sitting in his tax booth. It's not as if he's somewhere else. He's sitting right there committing the very thing that the Jewish people hated. But he goes to him. He calls him. He offers him the greatest purpose that a man can receive to live for the living God. And you know what? If Jesus was prepared to go into the community, to engage with the community, then that leads us to our second point. We must seek connection with the lost. We also need to seek connection with the lost. Just as Jesus had reached into Matthew's world and brought him into Jesus' world, Matthew, then the first thing that he does is he invites all of his friends to come to a feast with Jesus at his house. Now, I can just picture the scene. Remember, these are all Matthew's friends, all tax collectors as well. It's as if it was a meeting of all the mafiosos all together in one place. Because Matthew got impacted by Jesus and he could not wait to introduce all his friends to this Jesus. He wants to invite them into his world. He is going into their world to invite them into his new world with Jesus. And now it begs the question, who are you hanging out with that does not know Christ? Who are the unsafe people that you are looking for, that you are hanging out with, that you are praying for? Remember, this is part of our call, just like Matthew inviting all of those people to come and hang out with Jesus. Now, in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for all of us that would become believers. And he said, Lord, my Father, let them be in the world, but not of this world. So as we try to reach into our community, what we are not saying is that we live a life of compromise and live unholy lives to go and reach the people in our community. Not at all. But what it's also not saying is that we need to retreat out of the community because we don't want to be tainted by sinful people. Remember, what it is saying here is that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. We are going in to invite people into our new world to meet with Jesus. And here are a few practical pointers that I do want to leave with you. Don't be surprised about the morality in the community and don't be offended by it either. Okay? Firstly, remember that a sinner's job description is to sin. That is what they do. Don't be surprised or offended by the morality that you're going to find in the community. Let's not be judgmental walking around. How can people do this? When people are disconnected from God, anything is possible. And secondly, we don't have everything figured out as believers. Let's be honest about that. Yes, we are forgiven by Jesus and we are empowered by His Holy Spirit to live holy lives. But let's be honest, every day we live, it is a, it's another lesson learned on how we can honor Jesus more in our daily walk. So let's not be too holier than thou. The grace of God has been poured out upon us. Let's have grace for other people. Also, 
For many new believers, often there might be certain relationships that might be tempting to draw you back into the very things that were holding you back before you came to Jesus. Watch out for those. We are not saying don't reach out. We want you to go and invite your friends to come and meet with Jesus, but be accountable to some other believers. Be prayerful about it. Be wise about how you reach out especially if you come from a really broken background. We think that is vitally important, but let's trust God that He's going to use you and me to reach into this community because you know what? That's exactly what Jesus did. And this leads me to my very last point, and that is that we know the great physician. We know the great physician. Over the December holidays, I played some tennis with a few family members. And I'll be honest with you, I had not played tennis for quite a while. And due to my competitive nature, the matches continued on and on. I probably pushed my body to a place where it did not want to go. And it was fatigued and tired and sore. And in all honesty, I think uh, that entire situation would have made a whole bunch of people laugh in a movie theater. And this week, I had to go for an ultrasound to check out the damage that was done to my shoulder and while doing the ultrasound I'm always so struck and amazed by modern medicine right there on the screen in front of me in real time I was able to see as I was busy moving the arm around where exactly the damage was they could pinpoint it they could diagnose it and then they could also give the treatment alternatives of what needed to be done to that shoulder but here's the kicker. We know the great physician. As great as modern medicine is, Jesus said it's not the healthy that need a physician, it is the sick. And do you know what? We know this great physician greater than any other modern medicine. He is the physician that has been able to diagnose our disease, which is the disease of sin. It's the disease of a lack of intimacy, the disease of a lack of meaning and purpose for our lives. And you know what? Not only does Jesus diagnose the sin, He Himself is the very solution to those problems. Because of the death on the cross and His resurrection, He was able to deal with our sin, reconcile us with God, forgive our sin, and also embower us with a great sense of meaning and purpose and intimacy that we so crave. And you know what? There is no modern pill, no modern medicine that can give an answer to that question. We know the great physician who diagnoses and gives the great solution. So in closing, I want to say this. We need to live an outward living life. Jesus sought connection with a lost and broken world. In the same way, we ourselves need to seek out ways of how we can engage the lost in our community where we work, play, and where we uh, uh, have our community around us. And then lastly, we want to do all of this connecting in our community because we want to introduce people to the great physician that can answer the ultimate question of their hearts. And so I'm going to close with this. Who are you reaching out to? Who is your just one? And I want to encourage everybody here and I want to challenge you. Why don't you write down a few names, even if it's just one person that you are praying for, that you are trusting to serve, to share your story, to invite to coffee, to invite to church, to invite to your victory group, to invite to the victory weekend. Do you know what? There are so many ways that we can reach people, but it starts with just one person. This week, let's pray for those people. People, and we trust God for opportunities where we can make a difference in their lives and connect them with Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the great physician. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to end there. Dear God, we thank you that you have called us for a time such as this to live an outward living life. 
Just like Jesus, we want to seek out the lost. We want to engage our community. We want to connect them with you. We want to be your ambassadors in the city, in our nation, and beyond. Empower us, God. Open our eyes to see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.